This is Jeff Richards, Columbus, Ohio. You're listening to Barbecue Central. Let's go! We'll do it live. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh. Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. All right, good evening, and welcome to the Really Big Barbecue Central show. And it's an abridged open. It's a different first hour format. We are now into the third week of Origin Stories. He is already locked and loaded. Stephen Reichland is going to be joining me here in just one second. We're going to take him through the open and through the two main interview segments and possibly into that as we wrap up the first. I'm sure we could go way longer than that. Before we get started... The first portion of the show brought to you by Butcher's Barbecue, makers of award-winning injections, marinades, rub seasonings, barbecue sauces, and grilling oils. All the Butcher Barbecue products have been tested on the circuit as well as in backyards. Be the pit master of your neighborhood and visit butcherbbq.com to stock up right now. Without further ado, we race to the hotline and welcome back friend of the show, Stephen Reichland. Hey, Stephen, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I am fabulous, and I am really excited to continue on with the origin stories. We've had Malcolm Reed and Sam the Cooking Guy last weekend was Meathead. I'm sorry, last Tuesday was Meathead, and we will kick off the third Tuesday with Stephen Reichlin right here. So let's get right down to it, Stephen. When were you born and where were you born? I was born in Nagoya, Japan in 1953. Wow, in Japan. Yeah, my dad was in the service. My mom came over to visit, and the rest, as they say, is history. All right, so um, did mom and dad stay together through the duration? I mean, you know, it seems as I've been doing this, uh, anybody that's my age or older has trended to have both parents stay together. Certainly it's not always the case, but uh, I'm wondering if a similar situation for you? Um, my parents stayed together. My, my, my wife, my mother died early. She died at, uh, 38. So oh, wow. I did not have her for a long time, nor did my dad, but, uh, they did stay together while she was alive. Okay. And other siblings in the Reichland household besides you? Nope. Nope. Just me. Really? How about that? All only, right. Well, only. Yep, um, yep, yep. so do, would you characterize You know, this is just in your very youth, even before school, but, uh, you know, relationship with your parents that you remember, uh, encouraging, discouraging, strict, blah, blah, blah. How did that work out? Well, uh, let's see. It's a kind of a complicated question. Of course. My mother was a ballet dancer. And so I would say we had, I I grew up in a not a traditional household. In fact, I had a, uh, a friend down the street whose family sat down as a family every night at 5.30 to eat and they ate things like meatloaf and I was so envious of them uh, because we always ate very late, 8, 9 o'clock because of my mother's dance schedule. Um, it was uh, very, extremely, um, extremely varied. I mean, she, my mother was actually the family grill mistress and uh, she would light the charcoal with gasoline. Uh, real gasoline? Steak till it was real gasoline. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. <laughs> uh, in fact, we're doing a blog next week about uh, barbecue horror stories, and uh, I've got one about my mother and her gasoline uh, in that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, she would cook a steak kind of, uh, you know, black as coal and sort of with the, uh, the heart still beating in the center. That was Pittsburgh rare. Um, So, uh, you know, it was a fairly um, uh, unconventional childhood. But my dad and I did have uh, an institution. It was men's night. And it was uh, actually my favorite night of the month where once a month we would cook together. And I love that. Always interested in cooking from the earliest stage I can remember. uh, You know, wait until my parents uh, would leave the house so I could get into the kitchen and uh, experiment. Nice. Uh, We'll be talking about that here uh, over the course of the hour for sure. So, 
your your dad is in the service, which I I would assume gets you over to Japan. Um, does is, is yeah, your mom also Japan, yeah. is your mom also a dancer in Japan? No, no. Uh, she came to dance uh, later when I was. I guess she started when I was about five, four or five, five or six. Something like All that. right. Well, we'll have you. Uh, uh, so uh, she starts when you're four or five. Was she always a dancer? Like, did she go to college for dance or a school of the arts for dance? I'd, I've never known anybody to be a, a ballet dancer or know a ballet anybody. Dancer. No, yeah. no, she she got the bug pretty late in life. Uh, she uh, let's see, was an English major at Goucher College. Uh, super smart. Uh, belonged to Mensa, which I didn't realize at the time, but found that out later. Uh, started dancing uh, full time. Uh, I want to say maybe when I was six or seven. Um, danced professionally for the Lyric Theater in Baltimore and uh, the National Ballet in Washington. Uh, but you know the the um, you can't be a dancer past a certain age. So she took it as long as she could and then she taught. Uh, my dad was a businessman, uh, at the time an executive for a drugstore company uh, and then later opened his own drugstore. So I've kind of always had these uh, two influences and, and pillars in my life and one is the artistic, which I guess is what led me into writing, what led me into cooking, I suppose what led me into TV. And the other is business, which is, um, you know, I, I suppose this sort of I've started, I mean, starting a website, uh, developing a line of barbecue products. Uh, latest venture, which I'll tell you about, is I'm working on a line of uh, prepared barbecue that people can order, mail order. Um, so that's always been kind of a dichotomy in me. When uh, so your dad does the service, and then does he just uh, do the regular enlistment of four years or whatever it is, and eventually you get out of uh, Japan and, and make it over to Baltimore? Then we do. Yeah, he was in the Air Force. Uh, he was a pharmacist in the Air Force. I actually come from a long line of pharmacists. Oh, really? I think it was a little disappointment, at least for my grandfather, that I did not continue. But uh, but I did, you know, experiment with drugs. At, a certain point in my life, so I guess I, I, uh, I followed their footsteps on that. Well, quickly, uh, two things that we have in common: you and Meathead both experimented in pharmaceuticals as you were growing up, but also Malcolm Reed, who was obviously a very big barbecue guy, a huge on YouTube, uh, originally went to college to be a pharmacist. Uh, although no he obviously uh, he did not uh, end up getting into that line of work as well. So well, I okay. guess there's you know mi mixing mixing ingredients. You could go cooking or you could go pharmacy. And in <laughs> fact, you know, uh, in the 16th century, pharmacy and cooking were they were sort of two sides of the same coin. And uh, most pharmaceutical preparations involved food like saffron, you know, edible plants. Uh, and they diverged in the 16th century, diverged more and more. And, you know, today nobody would accuse pharmacy of pretending to be cuisine. But back in those days, they were very related. When you uh, lose your mom, uh, how big of an impact was that on you? And was this a contracted sickness? Was it out of the blue, like an accident or something like that? Yeah, it was very sudden. Uh, and I guess you could call it an accident. And um, it both, I would say it had a delayed reaction. At the time, uh, I thought, well, I'm just fine. You know, this is no big deal. I, um, I'll just go about my life and do, you know, it's uh, no big deal. I'm, I'm 17, you know, I'm a grown man. But in fact, it was enormously traumatic. And uh, I struggled with it for many years. I mean, I still struggle with it. Um, one interesting side effect, I was a rock musician in high school and I was in band and I really loved that. And uh, the day she died, I completely gave up music and I gave it up for like 20 years. No way. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was, well, yeah, yeah. Through that, um, is your dad there to help in any regard? I mean, I can only imagine, you know, I lose my wife and, uh, you know, I, I would hope that I would be there for my three daughters in, in any way possible. But then, of course, 
you have lost your life partner and there is a, a need to grieve in, in whatever way or however that would mean to you. So h- how was your relationship with your dad going through that portion? Uh, well, you know, this was back in the uh, late 50s and 60s. And dad's corner weren't, weren't dads back then the way they are now. But my dad was really uh, kind of uh, broke the mold on that. And he would go to parent-teacher meetings. He would make my lunch. So he was like a very involved dad. Uh, he, he had a hard time with uh, the career that I would say stumbled into. Uh, he was worried, of course, uh, how I would make a living, you know. Like all Jewish fathers, he hoped I would become a doctor, uh, which I didn't. Uh, and then, you know, to uh, go to cooking school after college, to uh, to start writing cookbooks, you know, to teach cooking classes. He really couldn't see it for a long time. But uh, he finally did, you know, I guess when I was two or three seasons into my TV show. You know what it was? We had a men's weekend in Baltimore, Boston. Uh, one day, and we were kind of walking across the street, and a car stopped and said, hey, Stephen Reichland, I love your show. And it was a perfect stranger. And my dad looked at me and said, you did okay, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, so so that, that piece was nice. Yeah, no doubt. Um, all right, so uh, through your primary education years, uh, like what kind of a student were you, like before college, before high school, uh, you know, what kind of a student were you? What interests did you hold? Things like that? Pretty serious student. Uh, I, you know, in my house, anything less than an A was considered a punishable offense. Uh, so I did well in my studies. Uh, I remember in my uh, junior year, I, I am not a jock. I've never been good at team sports or anything. But I decided I wanted a letter. So I joined the cross country track team and uh, that was something I could do and do pretty well. So I got my letter and then shortly after I became a hippie. So uh, it was, you know, it was, I was a very unconventional kid. I had hair down to the middle of my back. I played in a rock band, but I kept my grades up. All right. We are learning a lot about Stephen Reichlin right off the bat. So, uh, Stephen, we're going to break here and there so I can uh, keep format here. So let me put you on hold just for sure. a moment, and we will come right back and start talking about the rest of high school and getting into college. But first, before we found out what instrument Stephen was playing in that band, I'll talk to you quickly about Southside Market and Barbecue. Established in 1882, Southside is the oldest joint in Texas. They've been owned and operated by the same family for three generations. Famous for the original beef sausage, which is coarse ground in a natural pork casing. Plus, they have authentic Central Texas barbecue meat. All meats, including the prime briskets, smoked low and slow for many hours over real Texas post oak wood. Shipping nationwide via the online store, southsidemarket.com. Shipping customers can choose to order now and ship later, include a custom gift note, and mail to multiple addresses without additional charges, especially important to remember as we get on to the holidays. All shipped items are vacuum sealed to ensure freshness and ease of preparation for the customer. All meats are processed in their on-site USDA inspected facility. Two, I'm sorry, three restaurants to choose from at this point. Elgin, Texas since 1882, Bastrop, Texas since 2014 most recent one in austin texas as well grocery distribution through texas and many surrounding states 10 percent off coupon available for all online purchases at southsidemarket.com as you check out use promo code bbq central all one word lowercase that's bbq c-e-n-t-r-a-l all one word lowercase for 10 percent off your entire order over at southsidemarket.com and that's good every time you go to southsidemarket.com not just the first time so head on over and grab the sausages and the barbecued meat, all the good stuff, southsidemarket.com, and promo code BBQ Central to save 10% on your order each and every time. And we're back with more Stephen Reichlin right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. All right, welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. Visit CookinPellets.com for more information or purchase. You can also buy over at Amazon.com as well. All right, we are back with Stephen Reichland as we are doing the origin stories of our regular monthly guests here. So we get through the primary stuff here, Stephen. Uh, as you had talked about, into high school you found uh, hippiness. You got the you got the letter for running. Uh, what's your best mile? Do you recall the best mile you ever ran in high school? No, I don't remember, but I do remember my name was in the newspapers for it. So. All right, fair enough. Must have been good enough to get in the newspaper. So, uh, what what is being a hippie all about? Well, back in the day, you know, uh, it was defined by the length of your hair, which in my instance was long. It was defined by the music you listened to, which in my case uh, ran to uh, the doors in the Jefferson Airplane, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, It was uh, defined by being against the Vietnam War. And uh, if your listeners haven't or you haven't seen it yet, Aaron Sorkin's new movie, uh, The Chicago Seven, is a fantastic movie. Uh, but you know, I, uh, I protested, um, uh, we were, we were green. I was in an ecology club. I actually headed up an ecology club. So that was an issue that wasn't really on many people's radar at the time, but I was into that. Uh, was, you know, generally being a rebel and a counterculture guy. And then of course I was in a band, uh, I played bass guitar. So, uh, you know, and back then, I think today there's much less of a divide in society. Well, what am I saying? I mean, my God, there's a hideous <laughs> divide now, but we had many years uh, where we were not so divided. There was not, the get generation gap was not quite so extreme as it is now. Maybe the generation gap has given way to the political gap. Uh, but at any rate, I uh, wound up picking a school called Reed College in Portland, Oregon to go to for college. and. Uh, Reed has a reputation. Let's see, their motto was uh, anarchy, uh, anarchy, communism, and free love, or something like that. Uh, but it was a very rigorous school academically, and then a very totally freaky, un, uh, non-conformist school socially. And uh, it fit me like a glove. Did you know going into college what you wanted to study, uh, or were you just going to see where, your, where the wind took you? Well, I moved in a couple of different different directions. I actually thought I would be an art major uh, my first year. And then I, uh, I gravitated to the French department. And I think pretty, pretty early on, I, you know, I love languages, I love literature. Uh, and I, pretty early on, I decided I was going to be a French literature major. Were you, were you, were you speaking, Reed, I'm sorry, uh, were you speaking additional languages already at this time? Well, I was speaking French at the time. Uh, what happened when I was uh, 16, my dad took me to Paris, and then we traveled all over France. And it was, uh, as the French say, the coup de foudre, the love at first sight, love at first bite. I loved everything about French, from the, France, from the language, the food, especially the food. And so uh, I, I, you know, I guess I didn't know it, but I majored in French literature. Which, looking back on it, bravo for my dad for letting me. And that was probably the least practical career one could possibly, the least practical major one could ever practice, ever possibly major in. I mean, it would yet, seem oddly, like you were already setting the road up for him, right? Yeah, I was. I mean, I <laughs> didn't realize it. You know, looking back on it, I could say, yeah, it went from point A to point B to point C, made perfect sense. But at the time, looking forward, you know, there was no plan and earning a living certainly that never entered into the equation. With a, uh, just from a high level, with a French literature degree, I mean, what do you do with that? Is that something where you would immediately go into teaching or something along those lines? Yeah, well, that was my plan, was to, uh, to teach French literature or comparative literature at a university. 
And then uh, my senior year, I applied for a number of, uh, of different uh, fellowships and prizes. And I was awarded two. I was awarded a Fulbright to study uh, paleography, which is the uh, science of ancient script and how people used to write. And uh, the other was to study medieval cooking in Europe. Now, that bears kind of a little detour, uh, uh, Greg. And, Please. Uh, when I, my senior year at my college, you didn't take a test, but you wrote a thesis. So I wrote a thesis on a medieval poet named Christine de Pizan. And she turned out to be Europe's first feminist, the first woman to earn her living by her pen. Being a clueless 20-year-old, I kind of, that feminist message went over my head. But while I was poking around the stacks, you know, doing my research into medieval literature, I came across a medieval cookbook. And it was an English medieval cookbook called The Form of Curry, curry being an old uh, English word for food, for, for cooking. And I was blown away. I thought, my God, 800 years ago, people were writing cookbooks and they were exotic. They were filled with exotic dishes like Hippocras and exotic spices like Gallingale and Cubebs. So they took me both on a travel through time and a travel around the world because medieval cooking was very much influenced by the travels of the Crusaders. Spices were a status symbol. Anything that came from the East uh, you know, was considered a really luxury food, the way you might say caviar and uh, truffles are today. So the other uh, fellowship that I applied for was called a Thomas J. Watson Foundation Fellowship, Tom Watson being the founder of IBM. And these were much less academic. Uh, the only two strings, in fact, t that were attached were, were that you had to do your study, course of study abroad, couldn't be in the United States. And it couldn't be academic. You couldn't go to a university. Well, twist my arm. So I had this crazy <laughs> idea. I'll study medieval cooking in Europe. You know, I knew that there were medieval cookbooks. I was interested in cooking. I was interested in history. What could go wrong? Well, at any rate, I wrote the proposal uh, in a euphoria that was fueled with a couple of bottles of Retsina. And nobody was more surprised than I was when I got the uh, envelope from Benefit Street in Providence, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. uh, saying, yes, you had received a Watson Foundation Fellowship. Well, at that point, between a, a Fulbright to sit in a library and a Watson to actually be out in the field studying cooking, you know, it was a no-brainer for me. That was the second giant mistake in my father's eyes that I made. But at any rate, it worked out. I mean, I would imagine that being awarded, the, I mean, did he have an issue with the fact that it wasn't academic per se and that you were going out of country to study medieval cooking of all things? Uh, structure. It was lack of structure. Hmm. Uh, he thought I needed structure. And, you know, this was completely self-taught, self-generated, self-created. Uh, so, uh, but at any rate, off I went to Europe. And I kind of devised my own study plan, which was a, a combination of studying medieval manuscripts. And it turned out there are over 100 medieval cookbooks, all written by hand. I mean, I write books for a living, you know, so I know how hard it is. And that's hard with a word processor and autocorrect in your, you know, in, in Microsoft Word. But imagine writing it out by hand and people's handwriting was really neat by that that way I never could have been a monk and then it was published you know publishing meant that somebody else had it to write it out by hand so it was a prodigious feat of labor um, medieval cookbooks were not full of a lot of personality the way they are you know there weren't head notes like I always write about my travels and uh, but uh, there were some pretty interesting characters in the world of medieval cooking uh, one is named Tayevo, uh, whose name uh, literally in English means wind slicer. And I think that was probably a reference to his knife skills. You know, I uh, could just slice like the wind. Uh, his book, by the way, it was called Le Viandier, the, uh, the Victualer, uh, has been in print nonstop since 1390 or thereabouts. Wow. So I can only wish to have that kind of track record with my books. How long does the Watson Foundation Fellowship run for you? 
Normally it's one year. I turned it into a year and a half. At one point I decided I need to retrace the Crusades because that's where all the spices went. So off I went to uh, Greece and Turkey. Um, at another point, I decided I needed to go to French cooking school because I was reading these recipes and the recipes would say something like, take this, that, and the other and combine in the customary fashion. Well, I didn't know what the customary fashion was, but I figured if I learned the kind of the grammar, you know, the rules of modern French cuisine, that might help me interpret these recipes. By the way, uh, in Latin, the word for take is in take this, that, and the other is at equipe. And uh, that was abbreviated RX. And coming back to our uh -huh. conversation about pharmacy, yeah. so when you see Rx uh, in, on a pharmacy, that means, you know, take eye of newt and uh, hair of bat and uh, claw of bat and put them together. Was your dad uh, at all enthused about you taking the cooking classes? This was at Le Cordon Bleu then? No, well, first the Cordon Bleu and then at a new yep. school called La Varenne. Yep. And... Uh, I can't say he was uh, thrilled. He did come over and visit. And I think he was pretty impressed to uh, sit in the class. My job at the cooking school, yeah, I didn't go to the cooking school as a, pay, as a student. I went as a, because uh, I always have to work. I, I, I love to work. So I got a job being the translator. The chefs were all French. Most of the students were American. So I got the job being the translator, you know, <laughs> that French would, chefs would teach and then I would simultaneously translate. So I think he got a kick out of watching me do that. But I think in the back of my, my his mind always then still was, how the heck is he going to make a living? That's right. We got to get this Stephen structured. So when do you get out of college? Well, I got out of college. I graduated in uh, 1975, did my Watson year 76, 77. Uh, and then I moved back to, I moved to Boston. And I decided I wanted to become a food writer. So I wrote three articles, sent them out. I wrote one to Portland, Oregon, which is where Reed College is. So, you know, I knew that they would take that. It was about my Watson year. And I wrote one for the Washington Post where I had a connection. And that was about one of the chefs that I trained with at, at La Varenne, a very remarkable man named Chef Sean Brett. And then the third I wrote for my local hippie paper. And that actually led to a regular uh, monthly column and that kind of led to my being a, uh, I guess, an, a, an employed freelance journalist. Hmm. Uh, that quickly turned into a uh, gig reviewing restaurants for Boston Magazine, which I did for several years. And then that turned into uh, writing a wine and spirits column uh, for GQ Magazine. So, uh, you know, I was earning my living uh, by my pen. I can't say it was a... Uh, because it was I was living large, but I was uh, too too dumb to know how poor I was. I guess it was probably the only time in my life I had everything I wanted. In your restaurant reviewing, were you a reviewer that was unabashed in your critique of a restaurant, or were you somebody that liked to build places up and then let people decide for themselves? Well. I'm an, I was an optimist then. I'm an optimist now. I'm a glass half full guy. There are critics that go in with a terrible attitude and say, you know, show me why I shouldn't hate you. I always going in, I always go into a restaurant, still do, wanting to be delighted. Uh, but I also felt like I had an obligation to my reader. You know, some of the restaurants I wrote about were quite expensive. And I wouldn't want somebody spending their hard earned money on a place that was awful. So I tried to be positive. I tried to be honest. I uh, reviewed strictly anonymously. I never took, you know, they didn't know I was coming. I always paid for my own meals and always have. Uh, and that was a very great education, uh, being a uh, restaurant critic. You know, it's, it's funny. I think I've, so I've always been a freelance writer. I was an independent. And I actually uh, applied to and was accepted to Columbia University uh, Journalism School. But at the time, and it was probably quite foolishly, I thought, you know what, I'm making a living as a freelance writer. What do I need graduate school for? And I often wonder, you know, if I'd gone to Columbia, I probably would have followed a more traditional route. I would probably would have become a staff writer. And I don't think my life would have been half as interesting as it was by going the freelance route. Oh. At any rate, so I... I'm writing for these magazines, and and then two two kind of two things happen. Two big realizations happen. 
And one was that my mentor, a woman named uh, Anne Willen, who was the founder of the La Varenne Cooking School in Paris, said to me, because I wanted to write, I was dying to write a cookbook. She said to me, you know, Steve, you'll never make a living writing cookbooks. You'll never make any money writing cookbooks. So of course it was like, I'm going to write a cookbook and I'm going to make money. And the other thing was the realization that when you write for a magazine, no matter how prestigious it is, you're getting paid as a worker and that piece you write has a lifespan of exactly one issue or with a newspaper one day. And when it's gone, there's no more, you know, you can't sell any more of them. So with book writing, I think the other thing that impact, attracted me, and maybe that was the business part of my personality, was with book writing, if you get it right, you can sell one copy, it's 10, 1,000, 10,000, you know, 100,000, a million, several million. And you can keep selling books once you write them, and it's a lot of work writing a book, but once you write them, if you get it right and you're very lucky, that book can sell while you're sleeping. It, book can sell while you're writing the next book it can sell in germany it can sell in japan it can sell you know so th i think that was that was another thing that that sort of spurred me to write books uh, Stephen, regale us with a love story how do you meet your wife barbara and how does that story unfold fantastic story so I told you I was the translator for this, uh, for this French cooking school, La Varenne. And one day uh, in the class, uh, there was a very cute little brunette sitting in the second or third row. And, uh, you know, we made eye contact. And uh, uh, as, as I thought, you know, cute, very cute, not to be taken seriously. Uh, as Barbara would tell it, uh, that's the man I'm going to marry. Well, anyway, oh. doing this translation, so I'm speaking French pretty fluently, which, you know, I guess was pretty impressive. And then at one point I took a liberty with a particular translation and I said, the chef just said, oy vey. And I'm Jewish and she was Jewish and said, <laughs> okay, he speaks French, he's Jewish. That's definitely the guy I'm going to marry. <laughs> so uh, there ensued uh, a, uh, a, a romance that we had a 10-year a -year long distance romance. And uh, actually, tomorrow night, which is why I'm on your show tonight and said it tomorrow, uh, is our 30th anniversary. Wow. Well, congratulations to you on that. Uh, I just celebrated 23 okay. years yep. on uh, Sunday, believe it or not. So, 23? You don't look old not. enough to have you, Would you get married when you were in junior high school? Well, I got married like when I was 23. <laughs> So yeah, okay. so yeah, we're pretty close. But uh, you know, when you, as you know, when you know you have the one, I mean, why wait, right? It's, a, it's an accomplishment. It is yeah. really. Uh, we are we are both to be saluted. No doubt. Uh, and then, of course, uh, kids. So uh, I know you have the uh, uh, dietitian daughter, but are there any other uh, Reichlin rugrats around? And when do they come about? Well, they're. Well, there is. Well, uh, it was very convenient. Barbara had two kids, so I didn't have <laughs> yes. to do any work or anything. They just came as part of the package. Uh, and uh, but we've always been very close. And uh, so Betsy uh, became the, uh, a dietitian. In fact, she's the dietitian for the Miami Heat. And in fact, you all know about the bubble, you know, where yes. the, the NBA was doing their finest. Betsy was in that bubble. Wow. Very, very cool. Very proud of her. Nice. Uh, Jake uh, is a chef and uh, ran a uh, fantastic uh, brew pub in, uh, in gastro pub in Brooklyn called Jake's Handcrafted and now has gone into the sausage making business uh, selling Jake's Handcrafted sausage. And about three weeks ago, he just joined Planet Barbecue, which is my new company yep. uh, to manufacture mail order barbecue. So nice. it's, uh, Jake is, uh, it, it's a family business and and Jake is in the phone. Uh, so uh, just to clear up there, these were Barbara's kids previous, uh, not not yours, together. Not not mine. Okay. Uh, but uh, mine, in sp mine in spirit and heart. If un not undoubtedly. A, Was uh, that, in, uh, uh, like, how, how young are they when you're introduced? And was there any, like, uh, friction or get to know you kind of stuff? Um, I was, let's see, Betsy was maybe six. And I remember, you know, got to understand, 
first I was a hippie. Then I was a bachelor in Cambridge while I'm doing all my food writing, living with my two cats. And I go down to uh, Miami to meet the kids for the first time. Barbara and I have been dating long distance. And out comes this little thing in a pink dance outfit. And she sets up a little pink, uh, I guess you call it boombox back, back then, and does a uh, gymnastics routine. <laughs> and I am thinking, oh, my God. God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> but Barbara very wisely, you know, we dated and I was a presence in their life, but we didn't live together until after they both went off to college. And that was Barbara's, uh, Barbara wanted it that way. And it was probably a wise decision. All right, Stephen. So uh, we'll get into the books here in just a second. Give me uh, one more break here as we... Uh, pay the bills, as they say. We're talking with Stephen Reichlin from Barbecue Bible. So stand by, Stephen, and we'll be right back with you. And I'll talk to you quickly about pits and spits. If you are in the mark, listen up, because you're going to want to at least take a look. As I always say, please give first consideration to those that are sponsoring. Since 1983, Pits and Spits has been handcrafting smokers and grills in Houston, Texas. In that time, Pits and Spits has established itself as one of the premier brands in high-quality offset smokers and more recently pellet grills. Pits and Spits sets itself apart by using heavy 7 and 10-gauge steel in every cooker, fully welded construction that you can feel when you use the unit and 304 stainless steel roll-top lids and front shelves on every single smoker. So why does that matter? Well, by using higher-quality materials, Pits and Spits smokers reach and maintain temperatures, allowing you to worry more about the heat I'm sorry, worry more about the meat than the heat. And providing a fully welded smoker, you don't have to worry about grease or smoke leaking out of the barrel or the grease rattling apart as you move it through the backyard. And by using 304 stainless, you're getting an heirloom quality product that you can pass down to your kids. Now, where some companies focus on being low-cost providers, Pits and Spits focuses on craftsmanship and quality materials. Are there cheaper ways to make these pits? Absolutely. But they don't like tack welds, cheap stainless, and electronics that you can't trust. Having in-house manufacturing gives them complete control of their design and standards. That's not something you're going to find in stuff brought in from overseas. Their steel supply use materials that can be maintained in the harshest environments around. So, you know they're going to perform in any condition. And their controllers are made right here in the USA. They have unimpeded transparency into their programming. Pits and Spits has a dealer network across the country, but if there is one close to you, give them a call to shop, 844-650-6250. That's 844-650-6250. Whether you're a backyard grill master looking to cook steaks for the fam or a competition team smoking 50 racks of ribs, Pits and Spits is a product for you. Check them out online, pitsandspits.com, all spelled out. Or check their pits in the wild across social media with their handle, Pits and Spits. Stephen Reichlin. Still more. And excited. Stick around. We'll be right back. Howard Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. That's right. This segment brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or Bluetooth. If you have the smart speakers fully integrated with both, you can visit fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232, Fireboard 2 and Fireboard 2 Drive. And Stephen Reichlin is still with us as we're getting through the origin story. All right, so let's talk about the books, Stephen. You had mentioned that the gauntlet was thrown down to you uh, unknowingly by your, uh, your friend there over at the cooking school, but uh, you decided to take up arms and show her that you were going to make a living at uh, doing this cookbook. What was the first book? So the first book was uh, actually a book on Boston restaurants. Uh, called Boston restaurants. Remember, I was the restaurant critic for Boston Magazine. And then there was a guide to New England restaurants. And then uh, my first cookbook was a book called A Taste of the Mountains Cooking School Cookbook. Now, I ran a created along the way while i'm doing all my writing and teaching i i create cooking schools so taste of the mountains was the first cooking school i created it was a country inn in um, the white mountains of new hampshire 
And then that gave way to a school called Cooking in Paradise that I ran on the island of St. Bart's in the Caribbean. And then that gave way to Barbecue University, which first I started running at the Greenbrier in uh, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. Then the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs, and now I'm at Montage Palmetto Bluff in uh, South Carolina. As I was doing research, Stephen, I mean, is it fair to say that you had nearly a dozen cookbooks under your belt prior to the one that most folks in our niche associate with you, that being Barbecue Bible? Yeah, I may, may have been a few more than that. For some reason in my mind, I think it was about maybe 14 or 15 books. Uh, I did an, a, an, a funny, odd little detour that maybe your lead, uh, readers will get a chuckle out of. Uh, so, you know, I was reviewing restaurants and I was dining out probably 10 times a week to do that. And I developed a, a cholesterol problem. And, you know, this was back before the days of Lipitor. So I developed a style of cooking called high flavor, low fat, where I really stripped out the fat. And some of those books went on to become James Beard winners. Uh, one of those books was a book called Healthy Latin Cooking, uh, which was actually the first book ever simultaneously published in English and Spanish. Um, so and then Lipitor was invented. My cholesterol problem uh, got under control and it was time for the call of barbecue. So it wasn't something where you could just get on the treadmill and run two or three miles a day and the cholesterol dropped. You had some other internal issue and needed a little uh, yeah, pharmaceutical help. Yeah, it was, it was, well, it was chemically, uh, I guess. I mean, I've always been a pretty avid bike rider, but that did not actually solve the problem. Uh, so if you can, rec well, of course you can recall here we are in 2020, and you're still writing books. What was the book business like back then compared to how we're doing it today? Oh, man, it was the glory days of publishing. Um, I don't know how easy it is today to write a million-plus copy uh, best-selling cookbook, but... Back then, I did it twice within the space of three years. And you went on book tours, and there was a flourishing culture of independent bookstores. In fact, there were no big chains. There was no Amazon. So uh, it, it was a wonderful, intimate market to sell into. And, you know, publishing was so different. I'm working on the galleys now for my next book which is uh, how to grow vegetables and the galleys come as PDFs. Uh, you used to get paper galleys. They used to have little yellow stickies on them with questions. You'd write your answers on little yellow stickies and send it back. And now it's all done with Adobe on, uh, on the PDFs, which I actually hate. I really miss the old days, but you know, I had, I have the greatest publisher in the world, Workman Publishing. And back in those days, Peter Workman actually ran it and it was, you know, I remember it was funny after my five books, which, by the way, my first five books did not make money. So that was don't think that you'll write a cookbook and you'll start making money instantly. But uh, my first book that made money was a book called Miami Spice. I finally moved down to uh, Miami to marry, marry Barbara. And uh, and back in those days with Workman Publishing, you knew everybody. You'd come to the office. You just walk back. You just plop down. You know, you would knock on Peter's door and sit down on a chair and start talking to Peter. And, you know, today, Workman is still a very friendly, uh, casual uh, publisher, but it's still a lot more corporate than it used to be. Barbecue Bible, in fact, I wrote that book proposal. Uh, I wrote it in a day, sent it out to him, and we did a contract on the back of a napkin at a <laughs> restaurant. I mean, that's how casual it was. Peter was the first underwriter for my first TV show, Barbecue University. And that was at another restaurant. And I was talking about, gee, I'd really like to do a TV show. And Peter turned to me and said, well, I'll be your first underwriter. And my editor, a woman named Suzanne Rafer, looked at him, kind of kicked him under the table. Are you crazy? But, um, you know, in fact, it was a very good decision, both for him and it was a wonderful thing for me. He got me started with TV. Uh, and that's what, that's what publishing was like back then. Uh, anybody, you know, I consider myself incredibly lucky to have known those days. So are you 
under contract for X amount of books like a band would be when they sign with a Capitol Records or a Geffen or somebody like this? Or is it a contract per book, like every single time is new? Well, it depends what the project is. Like uh, my first book, Barbecue Bible, that was a, that was a one-off. Uh, and then I did a four book deal, uh, for, it was, uh, sauces, rubs and marinades, BBQ USA, uh, beer can chicken. And, uh, I forget what the fourth one was, but anyway, it was, it was a series of four books. And that was really nice because for about eight years, I knew I had income coming in. You know, when you're a freelancer, this is something you, you know, you can't count on. You always, uh, you, you always think about what's, what's next. Um, and there's a clause in most book publishing contracts that says uh, you write this book and then they get the right first option on your next book, next book. So I've always done that with Workman. Uh, I've been thrilled with my partnership with Workman. Uh, the only time I left Workman actually was when I wrote my novel, uh, which came out under the title of uh, Island Apart, but now has been reissued with the title I really wanted, which is The Hermit of Chappaquiddick. It's a foodie love story set on Martha's Vineyard. And Workman doesn't do fiction, so, you know, that was a, a brief detour, but they've been uh, wonderful partners. You had briefly mentioned it, uh, dare I say glossed over it, but if I'm not mistaken, Stephen Reichlin has won no less than five James Beard Awards for cookbooks. Is that right? That is true. Holy moat. Uh, I mean, uh, and, you've, you've been on and, my show for going on 12 years now, and I don't think we have ever talked about the fact that you have won five James Beard Awards. That's incredible. Well, well, and also three IACP Julia Child Awards. Yes, I was going to get to that next. No, I mean, you know, it was, uh, <laughs> right. No, it was, uh, that's an incredibly uh, gratifying. I'm extremely proud of it. You know, I think there was uh, some mixture of uh, skill and luck, probably with luck being bigger than skill. But at any rate, I'll take it however I got it. Uh, Stephen, out of the... I got to have a drink after that. Yeah, of course. Salute to you. Um, out of the 30 plus books that you have written, does one hold a particular place in your heart? I mean, certainly we love all of them because they're business and you're getting to use the gift that you have. But does one stand out above the rest? Well, I'd actually have to name two. And the first one is the Barbecue Bible, uh, because that was my first book about barbecue, and it was an incredible adventure, and it really launched me into the career that I'm in now. But I think the book of which I'm most proud, the book that gave me the most satisfaction, the book that was certainly the most interesting to write, uh, my novel aside, was Planet Barbecue. <laughs> and... Planet Barbecue, you know, I spent three years traveling, uh, visited 63 countries on six continents. Uh, my wife went on many of those trips. My family went on many of those trips. Uh, and it was just, you know, I, I think at the end of my days, I will look back and I will think that was probably the most fantastic four years of my life. When you were talking about uh, Mr. Workman being your first underwriter getting into television, is that something that you were pitching around just to see if you could get onto television or were you being approached by PBS or like, how does that relationship start? Well, it's really funny. Uh, and, uh, after I wrote barbecue Bible, you know, I, I don't think anybody had idea with uh, any idea of the kind of success it would be. So one night that may or may not have been substance enhanced, uh, I sat down and I made a list of all the things that one that I wanted to do in barbecue. And they included, you know, four other books at the time, of course, that's grown uh, a line of uh, grilling accessories, a line of seasonings, a website, uh, uh, television shows, a foreign publishing program, a barbecue university, and I wrote all these down. And I'm a great believer in making lists. In fact, in my wallet, you will find a list of the things I want to accomplish next year and the following year. And darn if by dint of making that list and, and kind of keeping it in my wallet and under my pillow, almost all of those things have happened. Yeah. Writing a book is one thing, getting in front of a camera and having people 
watch you on television is a completely different animal. How comfortable were you with that? I was com I was probably more uncomfortable than any other person who has ever been in front of a camera could be. <laughs> My first years of television were, were hideous. It was painful. I was, I, they'd say three, two, one action, I would freeze. Mm. Put me in front of an audience, put me in front of a thousand people and I can talk without notes for hours. Put me in front of a TV camera, I forget how to utter a single word. Uh, it also didn't help that, uh, well, it took me a while to learn how to do it and it took me a while to assemble the right team. And with Primal Grill, I started working with a producer named Matt Cohen of Resolution Pictures. And that was the right team. We were on the same wavelength. He was a gentle soul. It was never a raised word on the set. It was just so respectful. And at that point, then I started to relax and started to become, front of, uh, uh, become comfortable in front of the camera. And I would say by the time I started with Project Smoke, it actually became fun. And now it's great fun. What do you attribute the deer in the headlights to TV? I would sit here and make an argument that it should be way easier doing television where you have a select few of people around you who are there to make you look good versus getting up in front of a auditorium full of 100 or 5,000 people to lecture. That would seem to be a lot more nerve-wracking. That's a very interesting question. And it comes down to a single word, which is editing. When you write, when you're a writer, you can keep polishing phrases to get them perfect. And I think like a writer, I talk like a writer, I make TV like a writer. Now making TV like a writer is kind of a terrible thing because when you're in front of a camera, you're just supposed to talk and feel relaxed and not think about it. And so in my head, I was constantly editing instead of just spontaneously speaking. Now, why is it so easy in front of a, an audience? Because an audience gives you energy back. You make a joke, an audience laughs. You s say something that nobody knew and you hear sort of gasps of amazement. You're in front of a camera, there is no reaction. A camera is just a glass disc in a metal case that does not react at all. So I think that's why it was so hard for me to do TV. Now that you have found your groove in television, you're doing Project Fire, do you see doing some form of television at least through the next handful of years? Is there any reason you would get out of it? I No, I sure hope so. I love doing TV. I love doing it on uh, on PBS. Uh, you know, on PBS it can be instructive, it can be informational. I it's teaching. There's nothing mean spirited about it. Nobody gets yelled at. Nobody gets kicked off the show. You know, there are no cuss words or anything. It's, you know, it's a genteel and, uh, and cerebral place to be. And it just fits me to a T. Yes, I'd like to keep doing television. Uh, there's a show I really want to do. I want to move more into, uh, into travel with barbecue. And you've seen some of that, like in, uh, uh, last year's uh, Project Fire, you know, where we went all over uh, Los Angeles. So two years ago, we did that. Uh, I want to do a history of barbecue show, and I want to do that as both a time travel and then a geographic travel show. So, you know, that's on the back burner. This is America. Anything can happen. Within your lifetime, Stephen, you have seen an incredible amount of change. When you look back at what you had growing up as a kid, progressing through life. Did you ever think that what is available today would actually be something that would be real? Nah, I never, uh, I never imagined the ease and connectivity of the internet, uh, the way it brings us all together. On a darker side, I never imagined the kind of venom and, uh, and mean-spiritedness and awfulness that would come to inhabit uh, the internet and social media. And even 
on uh, my Facebook posts. Uh, a few weeks ago, I made a post about encouraging people to vote. It was completely nonpartisan. And the venom that that inspired was just, it, 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 was, it was hideous. Uh, and I never thought I would live to see that. I mean, you know, my God, we're all Americans. Uh, and I hope that we are just going through a dark phase and we can emerge and we can re remember that what makes our country great is when we come together, not when we, uh, when we fight and try and, and split apart. Having such immediate access to everybody at any time, do you go out of your way to try and engage or look at reviews or comments or tweets, Facebook posting, things of this nature? Because I could quickly go and peruse emails that I'll get after you've shown up on a segment on a Tuesday and say, oh, Stephen Reichlin, blah, 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 or he's so blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you don't even know this guy. And it's amazing. Plus, he's, they're sending stuff to me. And I mean, I couldn't be more thankful that you show up every Tuesday. So as, as somebody who is quite the figure within the culture, how out of your way do you go to either engage or just stay blind to all of that? Well, on my Facebook posts, uh, you know, usually a post accompanies the questions, this is what I've done, how do you do it? And I do read those, or at least the first 50 or 60 of them. And I do, uh, you know, if it's some, if, if there's a question I can answer quickly, I do. If there's, you know, I try and like things that are, you know, if somebody's done something interested and taken the time to, to make a post, I try and like it. I can't, you know, if it becomes a couple hundred posts, I can't do that, but I do do my own social media. So, uh, but in terms of uh, the polemics uh, and the negativity, uh, I'd, I'd made one post after Freddie, Freddie Gray's uh, murder, that's all we can call it. And uh, there was a lot of negative, uh, a lot of negativity around that. And I uh, actually wound up taking that post down with the urging people to vote post. Uh, I didn't read it. I, I couldn't bear to read it. And it was all I could do to get back on the next day and, and uh, post again. But, you know, this is, the, this is the world we inhabit. At any rate. I like to think, and one of the reasons I'm in this business and I love it so much, is that barbecue brings people together. I like to bring people together. I like to feed people. I like to celebrate food. I like to celebrate community. And uh, I guess if I were to give you know, any, any parting thoughts, it would be, let's let barbecue bring us together. Stephen, you have said it all. We've gone from beginning to where we are in 2020, believe it or not, all in the span of about uh, 58 minutes. And we could go on and on, I'm sure. So uh, first of all, uh, I appreciate you taking the time to continue the origin stories that I'm doing this month. It was absolutely fabulous. And uh, secondly, and more importantly, you know, I have really enjoyed our online relationship i'm sure at some point our paths will cross in person uh, perhaps uh, and hopefully more than once but, but the fact that you show up every third tuesday of the month on this show has been such a joy to me over these you know past has it been seven or, or eight years i mean i've been interviewing you since i think 2007 or 2008 believe it or not so i mean that's 12 years all on its own no, but no. The, the fact that we have uh, been able to, to have a relationship, uh, however that looks like these days, has been something that I'll, I'll just never forget. And it's the biggest moment in my barbecue career, and it's seared in my mind, is getting that first email back from you directly saying that you would be more than happy to, to do that first interview with me. And it's been uh, an absolute joy for me, and I appreciate you uh, so much. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Greg. And I just want to say you do a fantastic job. And I don't know if people listening to you and watching you realize how much work goes into these interviews, but you are always prepared. You are always, uh, uh, always enthusiastic. Your questions are pointed and interesting. You've always done a lot of research and background. So uh, this is a show I look forward to. And I hope it'll be another 12 years or 20 or 30 years. No doubt. Uh, Stephen, again, thank you very much. 
There he is. Real on. Steven Reichlin right there. Oh, my. Absolutely. Wow. All right. Well, we are right towards the Continuing top. to produce incredibly okay. mediocre we'll content in an exceptionally we'll professional we'll way. We'll do it right You're here. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's right. your host, Craig Ramsey. Okay. Thanks again to Stephen Reichlin. As we pound towards the top of our number one. Don't forget, coming up, like in 30 seconds, we'll be talking with Robin Lindars and getting her origin story. As we continue the month of origin stories with the show regulars. Next week, Derek Riches. And we have the embedded correspondence as well. Hopefully, you enjoyed Stephen Reichlin. Again, stories that I am learning that I never knew about. Things that I'm learning I had never knew about. And I've been interviewing Stephen for 12 years. All right. Let's line it up for the second hour. Stick around. We'll be right back with Robin Lindars. Robin Lindars.